be blessed. Let's welcome Rex Bornman. Thank you, Pastor. I don't need that. I love you, man. I love, I love, I love Pastor Rodney. Well, I may be the only one in the house then that loves Pastor Rodney. Yeah, now that was a good chance for you to clap your hands. If you're going to clap your hands for your pastor, for Rodney and Liz, would you do that well? Come on. And I love your worship bunch. Wow. I would, what, your name again is? John. John? Jonathan. Jonathan. Yeah, see, I should have known. That's that wonderful, godly kind of heart of David, brother of David. Yeah, yeah. it's just a beautiful thing. And Tiffany. And Tiffany. Jonathan and Tiffany. What a beautiful time together in the spirit of the Lord. Didn't, how many? Come on. Maybe you, maybe you don't know. <clears throat> Maybe you don't know because you're, you're like used to this, but this is, this is wonderful to have people who, who get it, who, who sing beautifully, uh, who don't need you to help them because they're, they're here to worship. But if you'll join them, they will, they'll walk with you uh, and actually sort of soar and fly with you a little bit into the presence of the Lord and just celebration of who he is. That is just wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I get a chance to run all over the world, as Pastor Rodney said, and it, it's, uh, it's sometimes disappointing to me uh, some of what's happened in, uh, in the church in the Western world. Uh, not so much so when you get into to Asia and in Africa uh, and various other parts of the world where there's just this, there's, there are f so few distractions. <laughs> Nobody worries, worries about running home and setting their DVR. Yeah, yeah they, they just, they're, they're not worried about most of that. In fact, most of the time they're just, they're, they're in prayer and they're in church and they're in various meetings and things like that. But in the Western world, uh, there are so many okay things. They're not awful, they're not horrible, they're not addictively sinful, they're not, you know, they're not going to kill you and ruin your life, but, but they may kill you and ruin your life. Spiritually. Because they, they become distractions, they become something that pulls you away, they become something that hauls you aside from the living realities of a day-by-day -day relationship with Christ. What Pastor Rodney was talking about, this Christ life thing, it's a, it's a phrase I coined early on in my life because I got tired of having to explain it with like 25,000 sentences. But the fact that Jesus is alive and well and operating in the earth and he operates in faulted, flawed folks like us. He connects with us, and he lets us connect with him. He opens this amazing heart's door to whosoever will. And, and if, you're, if you're not really just brainless and dumb, you go, yes, <laughs> amen. If God is, is recruiting people to be with him and, and of him and in him and, and live through him, then I want to be one of those. And, and that's, that's supposed to be exciting and powerful and wonderful and the, the thing that occupies your days and unites your moments and your time and your energy. And, and it's supposed to be exciting. It is. Yeah, it is. You, you'll get used to me in a minute. You'll get used to me. I'm going to give you a chance. I'm just taxiing. We haven't taken off yet, so it's all good. But it's supposed to be exciting. It's supposed to be more fun than TV. It's supposed to be more energizing than sports. It is. It's supposed to be more, but I, I have to be honest with you, so many people that I meet and have met since I gave my life to the Lord a number of years ago now, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth actually, uh, but, but there are so many people that I meet that I just don't know that they even know the Lord. And I meet them in churches. I meet them in places where it's just, in, and I just think, have you really met Jesus yet? You know, it's not, not, have you joined a church, or do you come, or do you go through the motions, or do you sing the songs, or do you even sing them well, or do you give, or, no, 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 but do you know Jesus? Do you have a living, vital, exciting, powerful relationship with God? I got to tell you, healing the sick is more fun than television. It's more fun than watching medical shows on TV. To have somebody who's ravaged with AIDS stand in front of you and say, is the God that you serve able to cleanse me and heal me? And to be able to say yes in Jesus' name. Amen.
see people mightily touched by the power of God, to see their whole life altered, to find people that are in the bondage and, and the darkness of sin and addictions and demonization, and to watch as God just sweeps in and sets people free. I'm telling you, the real Christ life is more fun than everything else in the world. But the, the Western church has come, kind of come away from knowing that. Really, we've kind of become more of a, we're going to compartmentalize and fit Jesus in. We've been preached this gospel that says, add Jesus to your life. He doesn't want you to be going through life sad and, and, then, and then end up in hell. Oh, no, no. He wants you to have it all here and all later. And that's the gospel that's being preached. And that's not the truth. That is not the truth of Christ. The truth of Christ is that you without God are condemned. You are lost. You are in the crosshairs of judgment. You are hanging on by a thread. And the judgment that you're under is the judgment of God. God's coming to rescue you. That's true from himself. Sit down and think about this. Well, you're already sitting down, but think about this. This is the reality. What is God saving us from? His judgment. The wage of sin is death. Who set that wage? The holy and righteous and ferocious and pure God who does not countenance sin, who doesn't say it's okay, but who wants to be justifier as well as just, who chooses in love to sacrifice his own son so that those who are in the crosshairs of his judgment might have a way out in Jesus name yeah. amen, amen. <laughs> that, that, that I gotta tell you that's incredibly good news and when you know that when you realize that when you realize how merciful and gracious and, uh, and amazing God actually is and that he's, he's showing this amazing mercy to you my goodness that's worth everything in your life you don't just add him to your life. He claims everything. I often ask people, you know, I mean, I tell, I ask them, as I said before, do you know Jesus? It, it's kind of annoying when I uh, ask pastors if they know Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> but I do that pretty regularly. In Assemblies of God churches, I do that fairly regularly. Hey, do you know Jesus? <laughs> what do you mean? I've been preaching the gospel for years. I didn't ask you that. I didn't. I'm asking you if you actually have a vital, living, life-changing, make-you-giddy relationship with Jesus. Cause you to fear sinful darkness that could attach itself to your life. Because you understand how awful it is. How, how, how just wretched it is in the sight of God. You know, do you, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? And it, it, it kind of gets them a little bit upset when I say stuff like that. But this is the reality. If you know him, then, then everything else should be kind of like in him. You live and you move and you have your being. You get a chance to walk and move and live by the power of the Spirit of God. And then, and then your whole life then has a purpose. Your, your purpose in life is to glorify Christ. It's to live in Him. It's to be a part of who He is and what He is. And what's God doing in the earth? He's doing the church. But He's not doing this, you know, wham, bam, boom, boom. You're in, you're out, fit in your schedule, be slick, be cool. I'm not saying any of that's really bad, but if you can go through all that stuff and miss Jesus... You can, you can, you can get, we have, we have a whole generation of people that have been raised on, you know, just snippets of information and video everything and instant boom, boom, boom. And their attention span is about that big. And so we're now serving up a gospel where the intention span fits it. And we're pretending to ourselves that that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel that does not require everything of your life is no gospel at all. Hear it? it this, is, this is the simple thing. So I, I ask these pastors, I ask these people, hey, have you met Jesus? And I'm asking you sort of, have you met Jesus? I mean, seriously, he is just like, whoa, amazing beyond measure. And this is after a bunch of years of knowing him. I'm telling you, I am more excited today than I've ever been in my whole life about who he is. But then they ask me the question, well, what do I got to do? What do I have to do? What do I have to do? 
And it's a simple answer. You just got to die. Well, I can see you're all excited about that. You're all going, woo! <laughs> Thought you were a happy guy. I am a happy guy. Because I have resurrection life. God has a wonderful life that he wants to give you. Yeah, he does. It's called resurrection life. And for you to get it, you've got to die to yours. Come on, force them, force them up. Just force the edges of your mouth up. You can show me your teeth. A good tooth offering will be nice. Now, if yours removed, don't do that. <laughs> Just for cleanliness and, you know, decorum's sake. But this is it. How do, you, how do you get into and enjoy the fullness of the Christ life? You die to everything else. All the rest of the stuff. Now, by the way, if you think this is a painful path, it's, you're absolutely true. It's a painful path. But if you think it's a self-motivated thing, you have to be, you know, you'd, you'd be the old, the old people that would, you know, uh, they would flag themselves. They were flagellists, they would call them. They would smack themselves with whips and things like that and inflict pain upon their lives. And, you know, so we fast, we pray, we this, we that. We got to go through all these things that we hate doing so that we can purify our souls. No, 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 no. You don't have to fix yourself. Come on, look at somebody and say, thank God I don't have to fix myself. Yeah, really, because you're, you're pretty bad at that, aren't you? I mean, how many New Year's do you have to go through <laughs> before you start to say, you know, I'm, I'm like, oh, for a lifetime on this fixing myself, changing myself. Your, your spouse is, those of you who married a spouse thinking you would change them? <laughs> Too bad, huh? Yeah. I can't fix myself. And that's the reality. You can't fix yourself. But God can. You don't have to kill the junk in your life. God will do it for you. This is the reality. And so here's my challenge to you. Uh, uh, before we preach, <laughs> before we talk about the things of God today, this is a truth that I think we need to land on here that, that he is just going to deal with you because he still believes in the reality of his resurrected life. Forever he is glorified. Forever he is risen high. He is king of kings. He is lord of lords. His kingdom is come. His will is being done on the face of the earth. He rules and reigns right here, right now. And he will rule and reign forever. And you and I get to live and move and have our existence in this. And so this is what he wants to do. This is the reality of his, what he's calling us to. And I think it's just that simple. When you start to embrace that and you say, okay, living God, I want to I wake up today to a living Jesus. I want to I arrive today at the purpose of God in my life. And that is that he literally comes into you in this partnership of power, this partnership of purpose, this partnership that I call a, a tremendous privilege. It's something that just works inside of our lives. It's something that he gives us as a gift. You don't have to be, this is the good news, you don't have to be the sharpest tool in the shed. In fact, to the degree you think you're the sharpest tool in the shed, that's going to get in your way. That's the stuff that has to die. Oh, this person would be, so they're such a good sinner that if they would just give their life to Jesus, they would be such a force for the kingdom. What? That is about the most inane thing you could ever possibly spit out in your life. Because that's not the truth. That's not how it works. You can't bring something to the Lord that makes spirituality happen in your life. What you can bring is your death clothes, your junk. And here's what he'll say. He'll say, okay, I get that. And I'm willing to mush take that out of the way. That's the sin for which Christ died. That's the stuff that he gave to cleanse you from. Are you with me? Come on. How many, do you, you kind of get this? Okay, so... This is the reality of who we can be today. And I, this is what I'd like for you to do. Would you just grab a hold of somebody's hand right now? Just grab a hold of somebody here and there. And, and if, if you're one of these people who is saying, I'm, I just, I'm not sure what all this costs. I'm not sure where all this is going to take me. But I clearly believe that God has risen today. We've touched a bit of that even in our worship time. There's a, there sort of was that sense, wasn't there, of just going, oh, my goodness, if we would just see him as he really is, what might happen? You know, really, what, what might he lead us into? Well, I'm, I'm for one, and I don't think I'm alone here at all. I want that. 
I want that with all my heart. I want to know him that way. And if that's you, if you want to know him in that way, would you just wobble a person right and left or right of you? Come on, wobble them a little bit. Wobble them. That way you know you're not alone. Or, or wobble for yourself. I see, I see sis over here wobbling all by herself. That's it. Now, here's how I want you to pray for this person in the name of Jesus. How many of you believe, before you pray, how many of you believe that it would be God's delight to make his presence known to them? It would be God's delight to kill away all the junk, deliver them from all the stuff, and fill them with himself. How many of you believe that? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, then, we just pray that in this household of faith, by the glory of who you are and the power of your resurrected Son, that you will live and move among us in special and unique and almighty and gracious ways. You are the God of everlasting love and kindness, but you're also the God of holiness and absolute righteous judgment. You are just and you are the justifier of those who put their trust in you. You set the wage of sin at death, but then you offered the gift of God, the eternal life that is ours through Jesus Christ the Lord. And so we say yes to that and to everything that comes with that, to dying to ourselves, to losing all of our stuff, to, to, to not having us have to count but to see the glory of the Lord in the land of the living, to see the renewing spirit of God in our lives and in our times. I believe, I believe, I think these dear ones that I stand among today believe that the greatest days of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ are not in our history. They are still ahead of us. As the darkness increases in the world, as the coming of Christ grows ever closer, as, as wickedness and, and, a, and just awful divisions just abound in the earth and among the nations, it's time for you to work in a powerful and wonderful way. It is time for you, Lord God, to raise up in the name of Jesus a mighty people who are strong by the Spirit of the Lord, who are filled with the life of God, who have the joy of the Lord. Lord, and the righteousness of the Lord and the help and the provision of the Lord who move in the power of the Lord. That's what you did in the early days of the church. And certainly that's what you want to do again. And so I pray that you'll do that and help us, help us, help these dear ones we're touching. They want to be a part of this. They want to miss nothing of this. They want nothing of the good will of God to fail in their lives. So help them, Lord Jesus. Help them, Lord Jesus. Help me, Lord Jesus, to be that person. We pray it together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. <sighs> Come on, take a deep breath. Doesn't that feel good? It does. Now, I, I, if that sounded mean to you, I apologize. Well, sort of. I don't really apologize. I just, honestly, I, I just think that the love of God is at some level offensive. It is. If the cross of Christ is not offensive to you, you've missed the cross of Christ. There's a, there's a tremendous offense, but he carries it away. You know, but then there aren't 50 ways to get there. It's just him. It's just him. It's just him. And that's the beauty of it. So I, I, I just want to encourage you in that. I think the Lord is so good. I, was, I, I mentioned what happened to me years and years ago. And I'll just quickly tell you the story before I share something about the early believers. Uh, this privilege business. I, uh, I was almost 21 years of age living in the northeastern part of the United States of America. Uh, it, it, I was a child of the 60s. I was a teenager in the 60s. Yeah, if any of you remember the 60s? You probably weren't fully engaged in the 60s. If you remember them, those who were fully engaged in the 60s with the whole drug culture and the craziness that went with it, we don't have any memory of it at all. It was just kind of, whoa, space, cadet, city, times, and life. And that's the way I was living my life. And I, I was okay with that because I was a total heathen and I knew I was a total heathen. I did. I had never met a Christian. I was almost 21 years of age, and I've never met a Christian, never been to a church, never, never had anybody, you know, uh, teach me anything about the Lord, N never. No, no contact in any way, shape, or form with Christians that I had uh, ever met before. And, and I was okay with that because I didn't think that God was involved in the earth. Now, I, I believed in God, because I just, because I'm educated. I was educated. I was a reader. I was, I had a, a, the capacity for learning. And, and so, uh, do you understand what I mean? 
If anybody tells you they're an atheist, they're, they're the most silly people on the earth. That is the most egotistic claim that anybody could ever make, and it's so untrue. All you got to do is, and I've seen people do this, Ray Comfort, he just gives them a little book, you know, or, or a bulletin, just give, the, give them this bulletin and say, here, see, take this. You believe in creation, you believe in just, you know, it can just boom, everything can just bang into being. Here, take that. And uh, let me just ask you questions about it. And he, he asks them, you know, do you think the ink just sort of fell, found its way onto the paper and the paper just sort of found its way into that size and that the letters all just kind of popped in there in the right thing and just sort of accidentally ordered these pictures popped in and everything sort of matched and went, went together and made sense? And pretty much everybody would go, duh. No. Okay. And that's a pretty simple piece of printing. Now, you're telling me that you believe that life just happened? The planets and the alignment of the planets and the rotation and gravity and the moon and the stars and the, it just kind of, whoop, DNA just kind of, whoop, happens. Serious, if you believe that this possibility of this level of complexity could come from an accident, you should be in your backyard throwing auto parts in the air all afternoon long because surely, eventually, a Mercedes-Benz will just drop out of the sky, if not a Jaguar or a Lamborghini or something like that. I, I didn't believe in, in uh, you know... Christians, I didn't believe in church, I didn't believe in Jesus, but I believed that God was, a, was real. I believed that someone had made all of this, but in my mind, whoever had made all of this and got this all going kind of walked away somewhere, you know, wound it up and left it. And maybe he's going to come back, maybe, maybe someday there's going to be some accountability for it, but in my world, that's just kind of how I felt. So imagine the first time I ever met Christians, it was on a Tuesday evening at Dairy Queen, I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but, but the bottom line was that they sort of were everywhere. And you could tell who they were, because they all had this, uh, like I pan a grin, you know, the big smiley face, and uh, they, were, they, they just were happy and full of life, and you know, they were young people, they were about my age, and, and full of life, and the Spirit of God, and smiling, and and they also were hungry. They had the munchies. Those of you who were drug freaks back in the day, you know what the munchies are. Just as a part of the thing that goes with drugs, it's you get sweets. Mmm. I'm craving a hot fudge sundae. And so I knew why I was there, but that's why they were there. Apparently, when you leave a good prayer meeting, you just get the munchies too. And so all these, all these Christians showed up at this Dairy Queen, and, and they were in the parking lot. They were getting stuff inside, and they had my friend Rich, who had the keys to the car, surrounded. And so they were just, uh, literally surrounded. Rich is kind of leaning back on the Volkswagen, and there's a whole semicircle of them around him, and they're talking to him. And, and I just thought, well, we're not going anywhere. So I'm going to enjoy my hot fudge Sunday this way. So I went around the car, and I remember leaning over the door of the little Volkswagen at the time. I was leaning over the door of the Volkswagen. I've got a hot fudge Sunday in my hand. I'm just ready to eat, and I'm watching what's going to happen. And this little Asian guy who's right across, I'm, I'm looking right over my friend's shoulder, and there's this little Asian guy looking at my friend and sort of looking at me. And he's saying to my friend, you may think that God wound up the universe and walked away. first words he said that I heard. You may think that God wound up the universe and walked away. And I thought, well, your aim is bad. <laughs> I mean, you're talking to my friend, but I'm captured. And I literally, I just, I, I was transfixed. I stood there and for the next 20 minutes while he shared the realities of the living presence of God and the plan of God and the truths of Christ, I just, I, I didn't take a bite. My ice cream just kind of melted down over my hand and was dripping and I didn't care because I heard somebody who knew God talk about God and the joy and the passion and the excitement and the fire and the life that was in it just captured my soul and I thought surely if God is engaged in the world and he is raising up children then they ought to act like this they ought to look like this they ought to live like this they ought to feel like this and I thought yeah 
And I'm just standing by watching. And so, you know, they, they had this prayer time at the end. And when they finished praying, I was watching. I was kind of staring. Do you know what I mean by staring, right? You stare at people from time to time. Everybody stares at people. Sometimes it's for good. Sometimes it's for bad. But you stare. And I was staring at these, these two people because when they started to pray, two of them just got, got hands ring around the rosy style and started skipping around the circle in a Dairy Queen parking lot, 1030 at night. And just saying, hallelujah, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. And then speaking in foreign languages. Apparently, they were foreigners. I didn't know. I since speak in a bunch of languages. I'm sure by the Spirit I speak in a few that I understand as well. But, but I'm watching them dance and I'm thinking, I was not offended by this. I was encouraged by this. I just thought, whatever is going on here is just, gah! and I'm bleh, with ice cream all over my hand. And so I, and then I realized they've stopped dancing. They're finished. And they're staring back at me. And, and I didn't have time to cough. You know, you're supposed to cough. <laughs> Act like you weren't staring. <laughs> I didn't have time. I'm just caught. And so this girl's looking at me. And she flashes off this huge grin and runs around the car. She grabs me by the hand and she goes, isn't this great? <laughs> and I went... Yes, <laughs> this is great because it was, it was, it was great. It was exciting. This is the most power that I'd felt ever in my life. And I said, this is great. And she said, that's awesome. Are you a believer? And I said, yes. <laughs> I had no clue what to believe. I didn't. But when I said, yes, oh my, there was an avalanche. They were just, whoa. And they're hugging me and fuzzing my hair, my long flowing hair. They're fuzzing my hair and they're speaking in foreign languages. And it just was awesome and frightening all at once. Seriously, it was an encounter with God and God's people somehow mixed up in the mess. He was touching me in my inside somewhere deep. And I just thought... I went home and remember locking myself in my room, locking myself. I wasn't that much afraid of a bunch of stuff, at least until then. And I locked myself in the room and, and I remember just thinking, God, it's clear to me that I want to be a believer. And whatever these people are, whoever they are, if you're really real and you're really engaged in the earth and you're really taking anybody. Here's what they said. God is, he's actively moving in the earth and he'll, he's just have to use anybody. He doesn't care that you're cool. He doesn't care that you're broken. He doesn't care that you've had, you, you've had a rough life. He doesn't care that you've never believed. And I thought, that'd be me. <laughs> I've been in a lot of those things, but, but he wants you to come. Whosoever will may come. He's inviting you in Jesus' name to just know him. And I thought, oh God, I, I want to. And that began the adventure. As Pastor Rodney said, I got a Bible. I read through the Bible six times the first month that I had one. Cover to cover. I mean, just plowed my way six times. Don't tell me. Don't sit around and go, oh, it's too hard to understand. Can't read the Bible. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And you need to because it's the reality. Now, I would teach you some things about how to do it. But, but anyway, I met Jesus. I just met him. And my whole life changed around. And I have to tell you that from then till now, it's been the same adventure. I've been around the world a bunch of times. I've had these experiences where God has enabled me to do lots of things, to be in church leadership, to, to train pastors for revitalization and church planting, to be a part of national and international uh, programs and, and efforts to do those kind of things. It's even moved us now into this, this future ministry that God has called us to, this missionary endeavor that, that we're committed to. I believe the 21st century church in the United States of America has to look like the church of Antioch. I believe it with all my heart. We have got to embrace the calling of the Lord to the nations who are moving into our neighborhoods. And I am so energized by that. So I think God is in this. I think it's something that is around the corner. I think it's going to happen whether you like it or not. But for those of you who will listen, for those who will step up, for those who will, who will get ready right now, God can help us to reap a powerful harvest in Jesus' name. But it's exciting. I, I, it's, I've never had to do anything on my own. I've seen the supernatural. I've, got, I've seen people walk out of wheelchairs. I've seen the dead raised. 
I've seen the dead raised. I have seen blind people see. I've seen healings happen, deliverances happen. God do amazing and, and almighty things. And I've, I know what the supernatural looks and feels like. And I'm going to tell you the truth. I never have to do the super. But God isn't going to do the natural. Sometime I'll come back and tell you more about that. But that's the reality of it. God does these things. This is who he is. And I am more jazzed today than I've ever been before in my life. Let me talk to you about the purpose that I think God has saved us for. I think why he's, he's called us. It's the same for me as it is for you. That we would live and move and have our being for the glory of God. It's the thing you wobbled somebody in this house about and said, I want to be that person. I want to be a part of that. Well, here's what that should look like. Uh, Jesus, remember when he said, uh, John chapter 4 is just where you'll find this thing. But in the middle of this whole passage that he, he goes off to, to meet one lonely woman at a well. And it's an encounter. It's kind of an encounter like I had where, where something, she just learned some things about herself. And this revealed thing just, just lays her whole life bare and changes her in this moment of time. She is impacted by this encounter counter with Jesus. But in the middle of that, his disciples come back. Remember this? They come back and they've, they've got meat. They've got food. They went to town to get food. That's why he was alone by the well. And so they've come back with the food and they're offering him food. And Jesus is going, no, I'm not hungry. It's okay. Now, the reason they went to get food is because he was hungry, as were all of them. And so now they're saying, well, who gave him food? And then here's what he says. It's tucked in there. He said, I have meat to eat that you're unaware of. I have, I have access to a food that feeds my soul. And here's what he says. My meat, my food, my sustenance is to do the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. This is more fun than food. You get this? This is more energizing than ESPN. This is more powerful than, than any of the other stuff. To, to do the will of the one who sent you and to finish his work. To live and move and have your being with purpose. This is what he said. I am here on purpose. Here's what he says in John 5. The son has no power to do anything of himself. John 5, 19. Except what he sees the father do. Because what the father does, the son has power to do. Do you get that? It's a partnership. God is working, and he's going to let you work with him. That's, that's what Jesus said. Trust me on this one. I've read this before, but you can look it up too. John 5, 19. So, and then he goes on to say, because the Father loves the Son, he shows him everything that he's doing. That's the beauty. You don't have to have great faith. You don't have, a great, have to have a great history. You could be day one in the kingdom. And here's what. All you need to know is he loves you. And if he loves you, he'll show you what he's doing. He'll show you what he's doing. And then when you see what he's doing, that's all you got to do. This is what ministry looks like. Did you see that? Do you feel that? Do you hear this? <laughs> this is who he is. This is how he is. And if God can't touch you, I could stand up and do a whole song and dance and nothing's going to happen. But if he's alive, if he's well, really cool stuff can happen. So this was his purpose. This is what he was here for. He's come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But clearly his message was for everybody. Every prophecy that had gone forth was that, that the Jew and the Gentile would hear. That in him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. That he would come as a light to the Gentile nations. And when he, when he launched his believers forward into this, in this great commission that we talk about, it's a missionary staple that everybody knows, you go to all the nations, go to every ethnos, every people group, and we've sent people all over the globe, and rightly so. But the people from all over the globe are coming to us too. And so we should be doing both and. Everywhere you encounter an ethnos, here's what he said, you live among them as learners, and you help them to be learners. That's what making disciples is. You run in and you go, I don't know a ton more than you, but I know Jesus. And the Jesus I know knows you and wants to make himself known to you in powerful ways. And we need ever increasing numbers of partners. Come along, come along, come along. Run with me. Let's believe God together. And that's what we do. And the early church didn't. <laughs> I mean, for, for the longest time, they didn't. The apostles got together and they decided, we'll stay in Jerusalem. Until God finally got sick and tired of waiting, and so persecution starts to happen. And he shoves them out. Remember the first Gentile encounter that Peter had? Do you remember that? It's in Acts chapter 10. 
God set him up. He gives him a vision. He sends people from, from a Gentile household. He speaks to the Gentile unsaved people, the Italians, the garlic eaters. And he sends them over to get Peter, fetch him by name, gives him the address where he's staying. And then gives him a vision that he cannot controvert about what God has cleansed, not calling common. And so he shows up, and in the middle of his, what am I going to do? God baptizes all these Italians with the Holy Spirit. It's big news. He took six guys, six Jews with him, just so he'd have witnesses. And he needed all six, because when they got to Jerusalem, the Jews were going, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're eating with Gentiles. You're, you're violating stuff. Come on. We know the religious rules and regulations. Come on. Yeah, no, 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 no. And here's what he said. Well, God did it. What a great answer. God did it. God did it. God did it. Well, who could we, what could we do? We're going to tell God not to act on his own behalf. And that was the first encounter. God did it. The second encounter is in the next chapter in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 11. Let me just kind of tell you what it says so that you get this. There was a, a scattering. Oh, you guys have scriptures popping up? Put this one up, Acts chapter 11. And let me just quickly show you uh, what the verses are. Start with verse number 19, Acts eleven nineteen. 19. Boop. You can see what power I have. No, no, no. That's 11.9. 19. 11.19. Whoop. Ah, I'm getting better at this. So, so here's this persecution, and those who had been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen, they make their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Antioch, by the way, which is north of uh, uh, Jerusalem, north of Israel itself. It's a part of the Roman colonies. It's also a part of Syria. In fact, it is the leading Syrian settlement, but it is the third largest city in Rome, the city of Antioch. It was a powerful international city, tons of people in this city, uh, tons of business. Tons of uncleanness going on in this city. Uh, the legend of the city uh, is such. Now, if you think Rome was debauched and unclean, Rome would talk about Antioch as the source of the uncleanness. And one of their poets said, it's the swill from the Orontes River that's reaching all the way to Rome these days. The Orontes River ran right through the city of Antioch and right by the groves of Daphne in the suburbs of Antioch. And so it is in this city that they come, and, and they, they had been speaking the message to this point to no one except the Jews. Now go on to the next verse. I love this one. Verse 20. Pop it up there. But there were some of those Cypriot people, these Greek people, Cyrenian men, blacks from Africa, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Jews, uh, to the Gentiles. It says here Hellenists, but the reality is that Hellenists had already believed. Barnabas, who was one of the, the ones that the apostles had embraced in the early church, was a Hellenist. These are the Greeks that were Gentile. They started preaching the gospel to the Gentiles as well as to the Jews. And this was big news because then God blessed. Here's what it says in verse 21. Read on. The Lord's hand then was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Now jump down to verse number, oh, where is it? Uh... Ah, verse number 20, I got to find it, 6. He, he goes to, they send Barnabas to check it out. Barnabas comes, he sees this amazing thing that's going on. He runs to Tarsus, searches to get Saul, brings Saul back. And now Saul, who is, who is a rabbinical reject, if you will. Saul, who is a, uh, speaks multiple languages, is a scholar, but God has clearly raised him up to be an apostle to the... Gentiles, not to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. And so Barnabas runs to get him and bring him back, saying, if there's ever a place that this guy's ministry is going to thrive, it's going to be right here, because we are a church that's already laden with Gentile believers. And so uh, when they do these things, God blesses them, and a great number, they stay for a full year preaching and teaching with large numbers of disciples. And here's what it says, they were first called Christians 
in Antioch. There's much more to the story that I don't have time to tell you because the time just gets away and I rumble along on all kind of other extras. But here's the truth. The reason they called them Christians is because quite, try, quite truthfully, they needed a new name. Up until this point, they had called themselves people of the way. They'd called themselves family. We're brothers and sisters. They'd called themselves believers. We are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Messiah. That's what they had called themselves. Those who wanted to pick on them called them Galileans or Nazarenes. And mostly, those were not names that were kind. They were more of, oh, they're hicks. Oh, they're the bunch of Jewish rejects. They're the people who couldn't make it in mainstream Judaism. They're the offshoot freak bunch. They're the Jesus people. Amen. <laughs> That's who they are. They're the, they're the Jesus bunch. And so here's what they said. We need to give them a name now. Because these people are Jews and Gentiles. They're black and they're white and they're red and they're yellow. They're, they speak a variety of languages. They come from varieties of places. And they're not losing any of those things. But they're gaining something that unites them. They're hooked to Christ, every one of them. Whether they're black or white or red or not. They're hooked to Christ. No matter what their history is, they're hooked to Christ. So what are you going to call them? We're going to call them little Christs. They're Christians. There's Christianettes. They're the little, here they come. And there's not just one of them. They're everywhere. This is the church that God birthed. A missional church. Just listen to these real quickly. A missional church. That means everybody helping everybody. Everybody called, not just a few, everybody called. To whom? Everybody. Who's, who's a candidate to be saved? Everybody. So you can ask people, do you know Jesus? Have you met Jesus? Even though they say they've been saved for 52 years. Ask them. Ask them. Why? Because that's our mission. And we are missional people. They were multi-people. And by multi, I mean they were multi-ethnic. They were multi-congregational. They were. They didn't meet in one. They never had big buildings. They had all kind of small houses that they would meet in. And how many of you know that the people from Africa who spoke a dialect probably spoke in that dialect when they had meetings among themselves? And the Greeks spoke Greek, and the Hebrews spoke Hebrew, and the various ones, they were multi-language people. They were multi-congregational. They were multi-ethnic in their approach to ministry. And God blessed them, and he made them mighty through God. See, I believe that this is what the church is still supposed to be. It's what's got me awake and alive in the Spirit of God right now, and I just can't get past this because not only is this church missional, not only a multi and multiplying church, but this church is mighty through God for the glory of Christ. Here's the truth. This is, at least this is what the historians say. The power of God through this church, we already know what happens. It's, it, it gives birth. It's from this church that God says, this now, this vision, this multi-vision is the one I, I want to spread this all over the world. I'm going to send missionaries from here, everywhere, everywhere. We're going to be intentional about this from now on. Why? Because that's who God is. It's what he's doing. But that home-based church, not only was it the source of missions, but th here's the statisticians. This is what the historians say. When they first came to the city of Antioch, the first verses that we read in Acts chapter 11, there were probably a half a million people who lived in Antioch. It was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. So about a half a million people who lived there and, and these few Christians who came in. But by 250 years later than that, when they were taking census, the city had grown to almost 800,000 people. But among the 800,000 people in 200 years, there were 200,000 Believing Christians. Did you hear that? That's the estimate. That's the historian's estimate. That's not a church person. That's not somebody who's, who's counting eyes instead of noses when they write down the attendances. That's not somebody inflating the figures. This is the historians admitting that God has done something amazing in this city. And it's not just amazing in the moment. It is amazingly enduring and reproductive in Jesus' name. Amen.
This is what I think God's called us to. And I think that's what you guys need to be. I think that's what God has called me to. I think that's what we need to partner with the Lord about as we move into the future. And everybody who believed it said, amen. Pastor, I am done. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here.